a huge thing in models is whether the model's linear or not, okay? So if the model, if all variables, which I'll give you some examples, appear in a linear way in the equations, the model's said to be linear. It can be a differential equation or it could be an algebraic equation, okay? That is the dream case because if the model is linear, you can solve it analytically, usually. I mean, essentially always, okay? So all the tools that I teach you that, or it's most of the tools I teach you that I can easily give you on a test apply to linear equations, linear models. If the model is nonlinear, which means some variables appear in a nonlinear way, so see, see this temperature? This appears in a noticeably nonlinear way. It appears in an exponential term. If something appears in a linear way, it, it would be like this. My, my handwriting is notoriously poor, so that's why I use slides. You'll, you'll appreciate this, okay? So this says uh, the reaction rate is just some constant A plus some constant times temperature, okay? Let's say you, that's a linear relationship. That depends linearly on temperature, okay? Linear models are much, much easier to deal with, as we'll see. Okay, boundary conditions. So these are a little hard for you guys to um, understand because they apply only to differential equations. Um, but I'll just say that if there's two cases, so when you solve differential equations, you have to solve these subject to things called boundary conditions, okay? And um, if these boundary conditions are all specified at one spatial place, it's called an initial value problem, and it's much easier than the second case. We'll come, we'll get to this, okay? So in terms of complexity, what you'd want is the first case, system be linear, time independent, which means it's steady state, low dimensional, how about a single equation? And how about it being just an algebraic <laughs> equation, not a differential one? That would be this ridiculous case, right? <coughs> this is like you get in third grade, at least I think. Solve that equation for x. A and b are constants. Uh, okay, that's, I'm hoping you find that uniquely unchallenging. Um, on the other hand, if the system is nonlinear, it depends on time, it's very high dimensional, it has mixed boundary conditions, which you don't quite get. It's a partial differential equation. That's a whole different ballgame, right? And so um, we're not going to ever get to the case that I call complex, but we're going to march from the case that's simple, which everyone knows how to solve, increasingly more complex as we go through the course. All right. So I'm going to go through some examples. I'm picking examples that I hope will be consistent with what you know about chemical engineering, okay? Occasionally, I'll step slightly, in this lecture, I might step a little bit beyond because I'm trying to prove a point, okay? And the, the point of this is not for you to understand every detail. It's to put some meat on what I just said, like what does an algebraic equation model look like, okay? So here's a very simple system, um, but actually very important. So what are you doing? You're putting fluid into a tank. The, the, so W is a mass flow rate, you know, like kilograms per hour. So WI is the inlet flow and WO is the outlet flow, okay? And then you have a volume of fluid in the tank. We assume this is a cylindrical tank. It has a cross-sectional area A and then has a liquid level height H. And so the volume is A times H, okay? Now, when you look at the system, the first thing you should appreciate is that if at least, I hope you would think this way. If the flow in and the flow out of this tank are equal, that level probably is not going to be changing, right? All right, so that's the first case. So when I say linear algebraic model, what I've done here is I've said, I've set on the left-hand side, and I should really, to point to the equations, I have to come over here. I hope this pointer can point. It's not bad, okay. So what have I done here? I've just written a balance. This is just a mass balance, right? Accumulation equals in minus out plus generation. We don't generate mass because we don't do nuclear reactions. So there's no, there's no accumulation of mass, okay? Because I'm telling you, I'm, that's a standing assumption in this problem. No accumulation of mass. <coughs> there's the mass flow rate in, and I should have written this more explicitly. Um, someone's adding some really big numbers here. All right. Um, 
this is the assumption I'm making for the outlet flow. Okay, so you've seen this kind of drive. So there's a valve here. You see this, and if, I don't know if you've seen this kind of gravity-driven flow, but you'd expect if you have some resistance to flow here, the flow is going to increase as the level of this tank increases, right? Because that's the pressure pushing down on the valve. I guess you'll learn that in heat and mass balances. I don't know, or fluids, I should say. Um, and so I'm telling you that that is the flow rate. That's how it depends on the level, and therefore that's the outlet flow, right? So that just, I mean, so if I ask you to solve this equation, what am I interested in here? Probably the level, okay? That CV here is some characteristic of this valve. It's called the valve characteristic, CV, okay? So if I gave you the inlet flow and I gave you that parameter, the and I want you to solve that for H, I'm hoping you agree that's not that challenging, okay? So this is a linear algebraic equation. Why? Because the only unknown in this equation is H and it appears in a linear fashion. Okay? Now, actually, a more reasonable model for this outlet flow is this. Okay? For reasons you'll learn later. Okay? It's more likely, it's more reasonable to assume it, appear, it depends on the square root of the level than actually the level itself. Okay? So if you make that assumption, then it's not a big step just to substitute that in for the outlet flow and you get this. Now this is also easy to solve, but this equation is not linear, right? Because the square root of H is not a linear function of H, it's a nonlinear function of H. So this is a nonlinear equation. This one happens to be easy to solve, but generally they're not going to be so easy to solve. All right, now tell me if this is true. When you took 120, you did mass and energy balances, right? Please tell me you did, okay? Otherwise, there's nothing I can teach you in this class. All right, so you always wrote this equation, right? I don't know what book you use, but you know, accumulation equals N minus out plus generation, right? And then you try to substitute in those terms. So my question for you is, did they, was there, did you ever cover many cases where they, the, the st usual thing they do is throw the accumulation term away and say it's zero. That makes the model steady state, right? Is, but have you seen, have you seen this or not? You've seen the, the, because this leads to a differential equation. I'm just trying to get some handle on whether this is, like, I don't expect this to be highly comfortable. What I'm trying to deduce is it all entirely bizarre to you. It's familiar. It's kind of familiar, okay. So what are we doing here? We're saying, okay, well, the assumption here is that the inlet flow and outlet flow are equal to each other. Therefore, there's no accumulation. In other words, there's no change in this level. But if one of these flows is greater than the other flow, this level is either going to go up and down, right? If I put more, the flow in is greater than the flow out, this level is going to increase, okay? So that's what this equation captures, okay? So if we look at this accumulation term, just for future reference, which again, I'm pretty sure you haven't seen a lot, we, um, when you write an equation, you always write D, dt, okay, of the th thing you're accumulating. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to see. Have you ever seen this before? Okay. All right. So what I've done here to write this equation is I've accounted for the accumulation. So when you account for accumulation, you get derivatives with time. Okay. You guys know what derivatives are. You just don't know what differential. See, it's been so long since I've, <laughs> I've not known what a differential equation is. I don't even know I even know how I survived, okay? But apparently I was a child and I was okay, but not so sure. All right, so if you write, the if you write include the accumulation term, you take DDT of the thing that is accumulating, mass, energy, momentum, whatever it is. So in this case, it's mass. So I'm gonna take the derivative of the mass of fluid in the tank, okay? So the mass of fluid in the tank is, well, first of all, the volume of fluid, right? And you multiply that times the density. The density, right, is mass per volume. You multiply times volume, you get mass. You take the derivative of that respect to time, you get how mass is changing with time. So you see, when you write out equations, one of the first things you want to do is make sure the units agree on all terms, right? So I've just hopefully convinced you this is mass per time, and these are mass flow rates. Those are also mass per time. That's not a sufficient condition for the equation to be right, but it is necessary, all right? So this says how the, the level in the tank might change as the inlet and outlet flows change. Now, if we look at this equation, what's the unknown? The unknown is H. That's what we want to know, right? I'd have to, I'd have to give you the density, the cross-sectional area, the inlet flow, and this valve coefficient. I want you to solve this for H. I'll teach you how to solve it later, okay? But what I want to point out now is that this equation is linear in H. Why? Because that H right there is multiplied by a constant. 
And then this derivative of h is also multiplied by a constant. That makes it a linear differential equation. Okay. That's to be contrasted with instead of this equation here for the outlet flow, if you use that equation for the outlet flow, you get that differential equation. That's not linear. Okay. So I'm going to be able to teach you this is really easy to solve and teach you how to do it. This, once they get nonlinear, these differential equations, we're going to solve them in MATLAB. Okay. All right. So this is supposed to be a problem in stoichiometry. I assumed everyone had stoichiometry somewhere, uh, even in, in high school or freshman chemistry or something like this. Um, so I've got a series of reactions taking place here. Okay, I have two reactants A and B, and then I have three, what, two products, C and D. And so I have these series of reactions. You see that, and this is the reaction rate of the first reaction, second reaction, third reaction. Okay. So you can see C is produced in this reaction, then it's consumed in these subsequent two reactions. All right. And so what I'm assuming here is that I supply A and B, which are the original two reactants, at some known rates. So this would be like moles per minute or whatever units you like, okay? And so what I'm going to want to do here is to write out equations. What, so when you get an equation, when you get, somebody gives you a problem like this, okay? The first thing you want to ascertain is, well, okay, what is he talking about? But the second thing is like, what am I trying to accomplish here? So what I want you to do, so I want you to calculate these rates, okay? So what I'm proposing here is I'm going to tell you the rates at which I supply A and B, and I want you to calculate the rates R1, R2, and R3, right? So if I ask you that, you should conclude I better have three equations, right? Because I can't calculate two things with, I mean, three things with two equations. So I'm going to write as you can see here, steady state mass balances on the components A, B, and C. I don't write them on D because that's redundant. That's like, did you learn that? And because, um, so you can write, there's only so many equations that are independent of each other. So I, I'm not writing an overall mass balance here, but it's kind of assumed. So there's, well, let's just say we'll get back to that. <laughs> okay, it's easier. All right. So if I write balances on A, B, and C, I'm assuming steady state, no accumulation. That's where I get that from. That's the rate at which A is supplied, right? And this is the rate at which it's consumed. It's consumed in reaction one, and the stoichiometry of that reaction is two. That's why there's a two there. And it's consumed in reaction um, two with a stoichiometry of one, okay? And so with B, same thing. But, but it's, consu it's consumed in reaction one and three, both with a stoichiometry of uh, one. And then C is first produced by the first reaction. That's where that comes from. And then it's consumed in the second reaction with this stoichiometry. Okay. So those are three equations, right? So if I give you that and that, in principle, you can solve these three equations for the three unknowns. All right. And so for something like this, this is about the level where it starts to get painful doing this by hand, right? This one's not going to be too hard to do by hand because, you know, I would solve this one for R1 and R2 and so start plugging. But you can see this, you know, solving and substituting in works great if you have two equations. It's not very fun if you have three and then it gets kind of intractable if you have four, right? If I gave you ten equations, could you imagine trying to manipulate ten equations by substituting into each other to solve for the, it's essentially impossible, okay? So this is a set of linear algebraic equations, okay? There's no, differ there's no differential equation here, no derivatives. All the R's appear linearly, right? And, but it's a system, it's not one, okay? So we're going to be interested in how to solve systems that look like this that are maybe large, okay? Larger than this. Okay, here's another one. My, I'm going to start moving up here and my neck's getting sore. I complain about discomfort a lot. You'll have to get used to it. All right, all right. So this is another one you should be comfortable with, right? This is just a mixing example. I assume you saw things like this in it when you took mass balances, mixing two streams of different components. So, so what I assume here, I got a binary mixture, okay? Binary mixing tank. I'm assuming steady state here. So I have this. So this is the mass flow rate of the component and this is its mass fraction, right? So if I have two components, I only have to write, I only have to keep track of one of them because I know they sum to one, right? So there's the mass flow rate of the first stream, there's its mass fraction, there's the second stream, there's its mass fraction. I, I had trouble with PowerPoint, I really wanted these streams to not merge there, and, but you know, PowerPoint is, it wanted to make them whatever. But the idea is they're going into this tank, I should have put a mixer in here, these are, it's mixed all together, and then out comes a stream with a flow rate W3 and a composition X3. 
Okay, I'm just mixing these two streams together. I'm assuming this system is well mixed. I, I hope you've learned in like 120 the, the beauty of assuming things are well mixed, right? Because if I don't assume this is well mixed, then I have to try to describe the spatial variations in this tank. Okay, that requires partial differential equations like solving the Novi or Stokes equations using computational fluid dynamics. Okay, so everyone's like, let's assume it's well mixed. All right. So we shall. All right. So we assume this thing is well mixed, and then we write out two equations. Right? We're going to write out one overall mass balance equation. We're going to write out one component equation. Or you could write out two components and no overall mass. It's your choice. But typically, write one overall mass balance. Right? So there's no accumulation. This is the flow rate in these two streams. That's the flow rate, mass flow rate out. Okay? Then you do the same thing with the component, whichever component the mass fraction describes. There's no accumulation. That's the rate at which the component comes in the two streams, first stream, second stream. That's the rate at which it leaves the reactor, or sorry, mixing tank. All right. So if I assume that I know everything coming in, so I know these two uh, flow rates, I know these two mass fractions, then the only things I don't know are these W3 and X3. Right? And this is a lot, this is how, Chemical engineering works, right? I've told you what goes in. I want you to calculate what comes out. No, no surprise there. So I want to know what the flow rate is here, and I want to know what the, what the composition or the mass fraction is coming out. Okay. So the unknowns here are W3 and X3. So if you look at the first equation, that's linear, right? Because W3 appears in a linear way. If you look at the second equation, it's actually nonlinear because the two unknowns multiply each other, right? W3 and X3 multiply each other. That makes the equation nonlinear. Um, so this one's obviously not, I know you can solve this, right? <laughs> like solve for W3, substitute in, solve for X3. So it's easy to solve, but generally speaking, when you start having these algebraic systems like this and they're nonlinear, you're not going to be able to solve these by hand. You can in this case because it's simple multiplicative nonlinearity, but normally you won't. So this is a system of nonlinear algebraic equations. If any of the equations are nonlinear, we say that they're all nonlinear for sake of making life easy on ourselves. So, th so we're going to discuss how to solve equations where they might be arbitrarily complex kind of nonlinearities. All right. How are we doing on time here? All right. Now we have two. S so this is just um, what we did before times two. So I have two tanks in series. Okay. So I'm putting fluid in one tank. This is the exact same problem we did at the beginning, right? And then I'm taking fluid out of this tank and putting it into a second tank. Don't ask me why just for sake of illustration, all right? All right, so if I gave you this problem here and I asked you to write out material balances, and in this case I'm assuming that it's not, these tanks are not operating at steady state. That means the rate at which material enters might be different than the rate at which it exits, which means this level might go up and down, same thing over here, okay? So if you, if you deal with the this side, it should be pretty easy, right? The subscripting gets a little... So subscript one means first tank, subscript two means second tank. So over here, I just have this is the rate at which this, this fluid enters the first tank. That's the rate at which it leaves the first tank. It's consistent with that thing on the board right there, okay? The difference between that is the rate at which it accumulates. So I, and if I want to do this again, I have to take the derivative of the mass of the fluid in the tank. Again, that's rho times the volume of area in the tank, okay. I'm going to assume the density is constant, the cross-sectional area is constant, and this is going to give me a so-called differential equation for H1, okay. This gives me an equation by which, in principle, I can solve this and calculate H1. You don't know how to do it, but you can do it, okay. You can do the same thing for the second tank, okay. So that's the rate at which fluid enters the second tank. It's just the outlet of the first tank is the inlet of the second tank, right? So that's the inlet for the second tank. That's the rate at which fluid leaves the second tank. Again, modeling the outlet flow as being linear function of the level of the second tank here. The difference between the two will be the rate at which uh, material accumulates in the tank, okay? So density of the fluid, cross-sectional layer of the second tank, level of the second tank. Okay, and again, rho A1 and A2 are constants. So this gives us two ordinary differential equations. Why do I call them differential equations? Because they have derivatives. Why do I call them ordinary? Because there's only, there's only one type of derivative, right? Time. It's not time and space. Just one independent variable, time. Okay. Why do I call them linear? 
because if I look at how H1 and H2 appear, they always appear linearly, the, the, right? Because this rho times A is a constant, so it's a linear term involving the derivative. It's linear there. This thing's linear. That's linear. So it's every, everywhere H1 and H2 appear, they do in a linear way. That makes it a linear ordinary differential equation, right? But it's a system of equations, and these equations are coupled together. Do you know what coupling means? So if we look, if we, if we look at this equation, the second equation depends on H1, which is how you get that from the first equation. So that suggests we're not going to be able to solve these two things independently. That makes physical sense, right? You can't, you can't figure out what's happening in the second tank if you don't know what's happening in the first tank because <laughs> the, the, the outlet of the first tank goes into the second tank. So it makes sense. All right, so now you go, can go back to that mixing example. I think this is my last example. Well, not quite. Um, this is my last Modeling example. So now what we're going to do, same problem exactly, except now I'm going to count for accumulation. So before what we said is uh, this will be zero. That means the sum of the two flows coming in must be equal to the flow leaving. Now I'm going to not make that assumption. So the two, these two flows may not equal the flow out. In that case, there'll be accumulation. And so if I want to calculate this term, I want to specify this term for the mass balance, I do it on total mass, rho times V, right? Rho times V is the mass of fluid in the tank. Take the derivative, that's the rate of accumulation of fluid in the tank. It's equal to the difference between the rate at which stuff goes in the tank and what leaves the tank. What you normally assume is this is zero, but not in this class, okay? And this will be the, just, I understand the differential equation part is the most perplexing because you haven't had, we, I don't think you'll see another differential equation for two months after today, okay? And by the time you see it again, you should be comfortable with it from your class you're taking in differential equations. All right, so same thing for the component balance. So this is the rate at which the, let's say, component A is coming in, stream one, stream two, leaving through stream three. That'll equal the rate at which it's accumulating, okay? Because this is a mole fraction, or I guess you should say mass fraction. So that's total mass, multiply that times the mass fraction of that component. That's the total amount of that component in the liquid here. Take the derivative, that's the rate it's accumulating. You'll see this over and over again, okay? All right, so if I give you everything about these inlet streams and I give you also the outlet stream flow rate and I give you the density, then there's going to be two unknowns. Typically, when we have differential equations. The unknowns are things that appear in the derivatives, okay? So this, this right, because if rho is constant, you can pull rho out of here, right? Because you can pull constant out of a derivative. So that'll be a derivative involving V. If rho it's constant you can pull out of here and then you'll be left with the term V times X3. So it ends up this equation involves two independent variables, <coughs> V and X3. We'd like to solve for those. And by solve for those, I mean we want to determine what does it mean to solve that equation? I know you don't know how, but it means I want to know how V depends on time and how, sorry, what was the other one? How soon they forget. Okay. Okay, that's what I mean by solution, okay? I want to I know how V depends on time and X3 depends on time, okay? Now, these equations are not linear, and they're not linear because, again, if you look at this last term of the second equation, you have, um, well, wait a minute. <coughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it gets a little more complex because you have to manipulate the equations a little bit, but trust me, these equations are not linear, and, and so to solve these, so it, it doesn't matter if the systems are algebra equations or differential equations. They're linear. I can teach you and I will teach you how to solve them with a pen and paper. Okay? May not be fun, always, <laughs> but it can always be done. If the system equations are nonlinear, generally you can never solve them analytically and you have to solve them with MATLAB and I'll teach you how to do that as well. Okay? All right. So that's kind of where we're headed, right? And I'm going to march you through um, things slowly. But actually the first, that's it. We've just talked about the second and third part of the course. The first part of the course is on statistics, okay? Has anyone had statistics course in here? Okay. So you guys might find the material, I don't know, boring or I may cover it. I'm sure I'll cover it differently than they do in a statistics class where they might want to prove things. You know, we don't do any proofs and things like this. But these are the kind of questions you might want to ask, okay? So let's say you're operating <coughs> a chemical reactor. You do an experiment, maybe in a laboratory, and you collect this data. So what is this? You've done different experiments, eight of them, you varied the reactant concentration and you've measured the reaction rate, okay? And you would like to know, well, this is pretty reasonable, right? You want to know how the reaction rate depends on the reactant concentration, 
Seems reasonable that you'd want to know that. Okay, you can see they depend on each other, right? This is kind. I mean, if that's not too debatable. I can see that as I increase the reactant concentration, there's a noticeable <laughs> increase in the reaction rate. I've already concluded they depend on each other, right? And so now I would like to build a relationship between these, okay? So this is what we call regression, okay? You guys do this all the time when you fit a line to data, right? This, that's called linear regression. I'm going to teach you how that's done, like the underlying way it's done, okay? But we would like to what we call regress the reaction rate data against the reaction rate constant. Okay, so that would be one problem. There's lots of problems we'll cover. I'm just giving you some flavor of a couple of things you might want to do. Now here's a different problem. Okay, so you're making a polymer. Okay, I kind of have to explain this. So I, I, polymer, right, you take little monomer chains like ethylene and hook them into a big chain. It's called a polymer. And a key thing when you make a polymer is how long those chains are. It depends that determines the properties of the polymer. Like if you make it for bottles or you make an iPhone out of it, okay? It's, it's, it has to do with the molecular weight of the polymer. This thing here is known to affect hydrogen, for example, is known to affect this molecular weight of these chains, okay? So everyone knows that. But most people assume it does not affect the amount of polymer made, you understand? So it affects how long the chains are, but not the total amount. Okay, so you do a set of experiments like this to test this hypothesis. You change the concentration of hydrogen, you measure the reaction rate, and now you want to know, are these really independent of each other or not? See, it's not so easy without statistics. If you look at that, you're like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. You'd kind of plot this, right, and you'd see this. It's not clear is the way I would put it, you know. And then the question is, what do you mean by it's not? And what I'm going to teach you is what you mean by whether or not it's related or correlated is what we call is up to some um, uh, certainty, right? So if, you, if someone says, are you 100% sure that these are not related? The answer is always no. Of course I'm not 100% sure, <laughs> right? So that's not a reasonable question to ask me. A reasonable question is, are you 90% sure or 95% sure? And that's where statistics come in. You can only answer questions like that if you have statistics, okay? And the reason I'm going to do that in the first part of the class is because it's all data driven. It doesn't require any other chemical engineering courses. It doesn't require, you know, differential equations or anything, kinetics or anything like that. All right. All right, so this is the last slide. Nice. Okay, so these are the objectives. <coughs> and once I get the website up and running, I'll put the syllabus up there. I'm going to go through the schedule in a minute. Actually, don't get too excited. That'll probably take the rest of the time. Um, I'll put all that stuff up there, and once we get the website working, which, do you know who ECS is, Engineering Computer Services? Okay. They're not very fast, all right? But they control the website, so it could take us a week to, to wrest control from them. Um, but once we do, all lectures will go on there, and they should go on there well ahead of time. Like, definitely it'll be there the day before, but it might be even there a week or two before, if you want to. <laughs> if you want to look at it. Okay, so what are we trying to do in the course? First thing is, you know, the old generic, understand why the topic's important. Okay, all right. So number two is the real, the real meat is how to do statistical analysis of data, like the two problems that is outlined, how to do that analytically on pen and paper, how to use MATLAB to do it. Okay, how to be able to write out models, that's number three, just like I did. Okay, so I understand that what I just did, you can't maybe do yet. But the goal, one of the goals of the course, they call it mathematical modeling for a reason. It's because we want to be able to formulate models as well. That's number three. All right. And number um, four is basically how to solve models. So when they're linear, be it algebraic equations or differential equations, you can do it analytically. And if they're nonlinear, how to do it on the computer, which means with MATLAB. Okay? And then five or six are generic, right? You, you should. Yeah, I don't know. You maybe haven't taken enough chemical engineering courses to see this, but we say this for every course. Um, and, well, five probably worth mentioning. Six is keep learning, okay? You're too young to quit learning, so don't even, don't even consider that as a possibility. Five means um, how do we solve real, complex, open-ended problems? That's really the project is meant to do that, right? So one of the problems I find is students that, you see this when students go to graduate school. You know, someone will have straight A's, you'll think that's a super smart kid right there, right? They come in, they come in to graduate school and they're like, well, what's the answer? You're like, well, I don't know. 
That's research, right? So like dealing with you know, real problems that have a high level of uncertainty associated with them. Like there is no right or wrong answer, <laughs> you know. And it's very open-ended, and um, so, so that's what the project is meant to do. So you guys could bite off kind of a semi-realistic problem and solve it yourself to get a feel for what a real problem looks like, okay? All right, so let's take a look at the schedule, and then we'll be done. You see it's spelled out in gory detail. There it is. So it's not hard to understand, right? The left-hand column tells you the date. The second column sh tells you what the topic is. The third thing tells you what the reading is. So if I say lecture notes, that means there is no direct material in the book for what I'm covering. Okay? Um, and that's common for part of the statistics, but we'll get to that. And then finally, you'll see something due. So that means there's a homework due that day and what it is. That means I should have given it to you a week earlier. Right? So I see the first one is due on the 28th, which is a week from tomorrow. Is that right? So that means I'm supposed to give you a homework tomorrow. <laughs> I will, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so then, I, I, I don't want to give the homeworks too, f well, I don't want to do them too hard, far ahead of time because my hope is that I won't fall behind, but if I do fall behind, I don't want the homework problem to be something I haven't covered in class, which I have to watch out for. But anyway, you can see exactly what's, what's going to be involved, right? You see, there's a written homework every week. That should consist of one problem, multiple parts. Like it might be one problem with, you know, here's a model, do this, this, and this, or something like that. Shouldn't take a long time, okay? And it's meant to prepare you so that when you take the test, you know, so for example, before the first test, which is here, and you can see the date, they're, they're like capitalized. You can see exactly when they are, okay? So you have is, um, <coughs> the only other chem E course you have is thermal, right? Okay. And Wayfan's teaching that, right? Yeah. Wayfan's an assistant professor, right? And I'm a full professor. Okay, so this is how this works. If, you, if Wayfan is giving a test that day, you go to Wayfan and say, Henson said change your test date, okay? <laughs> if you want to be promoted. You could. It's a joke, people. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so you can see there's the topic, there's the reading, there's what's due. You can see up until the first exam, the first exam will be on statistics, okay? Ex exclusively on statistics. <laughs> you can see when the second exam is. Okay, and that will be all on, well, the exams are cumulative, right? But the focus of the second exam will be on linear and nonlinear algebraic systems. And then there's a final, and that'll be cumulative, okay? You can see every Wednesday there is a MATLAB thing. MATLAB, 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 okay? I'm going to do more than I've ever done trying to get you guys um, comfortable using MATLAB, okay? Because you know, you're trying to learn this material and you're doing MATLAB, it's not, it's, it's not, not completely trivial, okay? So I'm going to start with very simple things and then, you know, like this one will be how do you ex ex import data from an Excel spreadsheet and things like that, okay? And so I'm hoping that after this course that you'll jettison Excel, right? Because I'm guessing that's what you guys like to use and that you'll see there's much more power available in MATLAB. Okay, so we'll see how that goes. All right, so you remember tomorrow is this one. And there's actually, I actually have something for you to do. So try to get MATLAB and be ready to do it, use it tomorrow. <laughs>